Welcome to the Cal Corporation's series of videos about software engineering. The topic of this video is a C++ implementation of a ring buffer. Before proceeding, make sure that you have already watched these other videos first. You can often think of a pipeline architecture as a system of producers and consumers. Imagine a producer is in one thread and a consumer is in some other thread. The product is being exchanged from producer to consumer via a buffer. Whenever the producer produces a product, it places that product into the buffer. Whenever the consumer is ready to consume a product, it gets that product from that very same buffer. The problem with this is that the single size buffer doesn't afford any flexibility. Yes, the producer and consumer are different threads, but we're not really able to take advantage of that multi-threading because the producer can't be extra productive and quickly produce another product, not until the consumer has consumed the previous product, which the producer had put into the buffer. There needs to be room for more additional products in the buffer. Our buffer, that now has room for multiple products, is implemented using an ordinary C++ array but we're going to index it in a special way. We might want to be producing stuff for a long time, maybe indefinitely. So we're going to consider there to be no such thing as a last index. After the producer has written a product into the C++ array's last index, we will consider there to still be a next index by looping the index back to zero, kind of like a modulus operator. When we treat a buffer this way, we call it a ring buffer. There will be one index to mark where the producer will put the next thing it produces. And there will be one other index to mark which product will get consumed next, that is, which of those products that are in the ring buffer. Initially, both indices start out at zero. You can think of these two indices as chasing each other around the ring. This has the flexibility that we lacked from our first implementation. If the producer is working faster than the consumer for a little while, then the producer's index can speed ahead of the consumer's index during that time. And there will be a growing wedge of data building up within the ring. Later, if the consumer starts working faster than the producer, then the consumer's index will start to catch up, shrinking that wedge of data. It's important to understand a ring buffer's two boundary cases. If the consumer completely catches up with the producer, then both indices can have the same value. That means the ring buffer is currently empty. That's also the situation when the software starts to run. In that situation, the consumer's thread should block if it tries to consume something more, which doesn't yet exist in the ring buffer. The second boundary case is when the ring buffer is full. Again, both indices will have the same value when this happens. 
This time, it's that producer's thread that needs to block if it tries to produce something more. We'll get our desired blocking behavior by using two semaphores, one for each thread. For the producer thread, the meaning of its semaphore's resource is the number of empty slots in the ring buffer. That semaphore starts out with its count being the same as the ring buffer's size. If that semaphore's count runs all the way down to zero, then that means the buffer is full and it will block the producer. For the consumer thread, the meaning of its semaphore's resource is the number of ring buffer slots that have been filled by a product. That semaphore starts out with its count being zero. If our system contains only one producer thread and only one consumer thread, then we're all done with the implementation. The semaphores perform all the synchronization that we need. But in general, we could have multiple producers and or multiple consumers. In that case, we need to add a lock that protects the critical section. 